and we're looking at paper and paperboard. Nothing unfamiliar to you so far. All of you have seen this, what I'm referring to. Paper is used in a lot of different ways. We use it to share information. We use it to make our lives more convenient. We use it for storage. How it will be used is determined by customers' needs. Clearwater Paper's paperboard mill in Lewiston, Idaho produces paperboard rolls. Customers purchase the rolls and convert them into paperboard products, such as folding cartons, liquid packaging, cups and round food containers, commercial print projects, and paper plates. Assuring a strong, clean paperboard product begins with delivery of the pulp. Depending upon the specific product that we're manufacturing here, we're going to add some other chemistry that is going to help that paper stand up in a wet environment. We make a lot of, of uh, products that are, are things like uh, well, a milk container or an orange juice container would be something that would be a common thing for us to manufacture. Starting out at over 99% water, the pulp slurry is sprayed onto a moving mesh screen in multiple layers, creating a mat. This process builds up the layers of pulp fibers, assuring the final strength of the product. From a nearby control room, the process is closely monitored, assuring the proper mix of materials needed for the type of paper being produced. Once the mat is formed, the process of removing the water begins. Gravity itself is the first step, allowing almost 20% of the water to drip through the original foundation screen. Next, the pulp mat travels in between a series of sponged rollers. Here, water is pressed and squeezed from the fibers. After this step, the water content has been reduced by another 40%. Finally, the mat is strong enough to stand on its own and is passed over a series of heated rollers. This is a drying process and takes the moisture content down to only 5%. From here, the paperboard is rolled, cut to a specified width, inventoried, and readied for shipment. In another area, some paperboard will be coated with a plastic type of material called polyethylene. Plastic pellets are heated and extruded onto the paperboard in a very thin layer. This provides a very strong, yet smooth, almost waxy surface, exactly what you'd find on a milk or juice carton. A variety of products are made from Clearwater Paper's paperboard parent rolls. And all throughout the plant, quality control plays a major role. In addition to highly sensitive sensors and monitoring equipment, the manufacturing process conducts standard tests on samples pulled from the production line. This assures the quality product consumers demand. Containers need to be strong. Containers need to be free of contamination. Containers need to accept printing in a crisp, clean way. The consumer may like some of the material to be very white. White is a symbol of cleanliness. White is a symbol of purity. White allows for very clean, crisp, colorful printing. These factors all have their beginning back at the original pulp mixture. We have to meet the, the demands of the market and the, and the expectations of our customers. We do that very well, but it is challenging in certain applications, and we continuously look for ways to improve our product and improve the process that ends up with the final product. And that's very important to our business here. In, the, in, in this process that you are seeing on the screen at the moment, you saw it on a video there. Let me see how many of you really paid attention uh, to that video. Can anyone in the room or anyone online as well tell me in the video, they told you by the time the paper comes out the other end and after the drying process, uh, how much moisture is in the paper? Anyone remember what they heard? 
Five percent. Wonderful. Who was that? Femi. Femi Aditoro, yes. Yay. Well done. Well listened. Well listened. That's very good. Okay, so just in a in a nutshell, you've got the trees. We all know that paper comes from trees. Um, and, and the logs are what is taken to the to the uh, mill or the, the, pro, the, the actual paper making uh, facility um, where they pulp it uh, into, well, they first chip, make it into chips and then um, it goes through various processes, either chemical or mechanical or both, uh, and uh, ultimately ends up on a fordrinia. And, uh, and then we, on a screen, comes out the other side through a process of calendaring, and that is where the uh, excess moisture is squeezed out. And we ultimately have a, a coating process that fills up any valleys and, and, uh, and crevices uh, in that paper. And ultimately we end up with um, the finished product. I mean, paper, like paper, for example, that's on your desk in front of you. So let's have a look at that. In the mechanical process, in other words, when they create an, these chips, uh, from the from the log, from the tree, those little chips of wood then go into a mechanical process that is grinding those things. It's not really hard work. It's grinding down those chips uh, with with a lot of water, a lot of water, a lot of a lot of hot water as well, and they're forming ultimately this pulp. Um, uh, it, it's a very um, uh, a very intensive mechanical process in, in breaking down those, that, those wood chips, but they end up in like a slurry. It looks like a gray soup, not the most um, inviting image uh, that one sees. And if you ever have any chance of visiting a paper mill, I encourage you to do that. They can also undergo a chemical process and this came about slightly later on in life, uh, in, in a chronological life I'm referring to here, um, where the, they were trying to uh, in, in increase the throughput and they came up with a chemical process by adding soda, sulfate and sulfite, and, and it's then chemically washed uh, and bleached and so on. And all they do, a, pro, a, a bit of a combination of both of these processes, but ultimately, in both processes, they end up with this slurry, which, are, which is like a, a thick, um, uh, liquidified, um, um, looks like porridge in, in, to some extent. And this then enters this fordrinia. Now, the interesting thing is that this fordrinia dates back to uh, sort of around about uh, early 1800s, late 1700s, and it hasn't really changed. It's become more mechanized, but it hasn't really changed. Now, I've got a schematic diagram here because it's not an easy thing to explain when I show you uh, that, because that, that's what the machine looks like. It's about 100 to 120 meters long, so it's very long. Uh, there's a lot of heat being generated, but I can't explain anything in, in that process. So that's why we have uh, a schematic uh, diagram like this where I can show you where in that head box is where that, um, is where that slurry is going in. And it's entering a, and I'll, I'll move my cursor across here. This section here that my cursor is running on at the moment, that is the, about 100 meters long. So that is this over here. It's that, that area of the machine. And, and on that, on this bed, this flat bed here is a mesh, a wire mesh, on which the slurry is then poured onto. It then passes down that uh, conveyor at this, uh, um, mesh, this metal wire mesh passes along like a conveyor from the one from the left hand side all the way to the right hand side 100 meters uh, uh, down the line and all the way down all the way down 
what is happening here is is a is suction. They're sucking off the water. Remember, it's 100% water at the start. They're sucking that water off. They're also applying heat. So there's heating elements. And these are heating elements over here. You want suction all along here, the whole process. So you want heating and suction on that entire process. So by the time it gets to this point here, it's around about 20% moisture. It's not, a, it's not down to 5% yet. And that 5% would vary depending on the humidity, the ambient humidity in that facility. And obviously based on the region that you're in. So in Lagos, it'll be, uh, it's a fairly humid climate. It's gonna be much higher than 5% where you, where the most of you are. And certainly if you are in dry parts of the world, then yeah, it could well be down at the 5%. So obviously that video where it was taken in the United States, it was obviously in a fairly dry area because I've seen um, uh, areas, uh, I've seen uh, facilities like this where it's around about 8% which I've seen in South Africa and also in Australia, between eight and 10% when it comes out, ultimately I'm referring to. So this, this Fordrinia, which has not changed over all the years, is a very rudimentary type machine. And, but talking about rudimentary, uh, what I, this is a diorama. And I took this photo in a museum in, in, uh, in Germany, in Munich, in Germany. And the reason why is because way back in the, uh, in the late 1700s, this is how they used to make paper. And I thought I'd share this with you. You can see on the left-hand side there, that is your steam bath, which is creating the slurry. Uh, and uh, it's on, uh, um, um, a, a frame with uh, the wire mesh on it and you can see the fella bringing it out of the bath and giving it to this guy and he's now placing it down on top of one one on top of the other here to ultimately press the water out with this wooden apparatus here so they press as much as they can and then it's transferred onto these boards and then it would be further pressed over here, and maybe even taken outside on a sunny day to try and get it to dry. And so they didn't have rolls in those days. Everything was a section, a piece, a piece of paper. So that's quite interesting. This is how it was done way back uh, in those in those early um, stages of development. And from this process, ultimately came this fondrinia. Now, Fordrinia's was obviously a name given to the person that invented the machine. But it is interesting to note that certainly um, they've got a little bit faster, a little bit more mechanized, but the process has not changed very much from these early days of making paper. All right, so that is uh, that, that slurry, um, and you can see the mesh then it's going to ultimately get lie on as it runs into the um, into the fondrinia. But the interesting part is when it comes out of the fondrinia machine, it would now be a very rough surface. What do I mean by that? If you take um, an egg carton, an egg carton is a is what that paper looks like when it comes out the fondrinia. It's full of, uh, full of indentations and it's very um, uh, uneven. And ultimately we need to get it to paper like you know and what's in front of you on your desk. The paper that is on your desk has passed through a series of rollers that you can see on the screen here. And you can see, I've only given you a snapshot there could be many more, it depends on how smooth they want the paper. And you have different uh, um, uh, weight of paper. Now, the paper that's in front of you, which is probably photocopy paper, 
is around about 80 grams per square meter, what we call 80 GSM. That's standard across the world. You do get slightly thinner, down to 70 GSM for photocopy paper, but the most common one across the world is 80 GSM. And you know yourself that the paper in front of you is very smooth. It's not like an egg carton. So how do we do this? And this is done by a series of rollers, but at the same time, they are adding starch, resin, clay fillers to fill up those indentations to make it level and smooth like the paper that you have there. It's nice for printability um, and it's uniform in its weight and therefore is able to be handled suitably in photocopy machines. So it's very important to get it to a particular density. The paper must come to a particular density and we measure that then as grams per square meter. So remember that when it comes out of the Fordrinia, it does not look like the paper on your desk. It has to go through this calendaring, calendaring process where we're adding starch, resin, and clay fillers so that we can fill up all those crevices and valleys and make it nice and smooth. And you know yourself, if you take pasta and you're making pasta and you're rolling it with a, with a rolling pin, it becomes smooth. And that same principle is happening here when you have all those rollers. It's making it nice and smooth. So there are a couple of things that you need to understand with paper. Now, you can do it there in front of you. Um, you can take a piece of paper because we need to establish what is the grain direction of the paper. So if you have a piece of paper, a, a, a normal piece of paper, a, you know, a four size paper in front of you, take the paper and tear it down the center like this. Okay, you can see it's tearing nice and easily. If I tear it the other way, I tore it this way first, and it went nice and straight. If I tear it this way, let's see what happens. Look what happens. It's tearing very skew. So that tells me that the grain of this paper is running down lengthwise in this paper. You can do the same process right in front of you there, but you tear it nice and slowly and put the same amount of pressure on both your hands so that you fear that if it starts tearing to the one side, let it do that. And that shows you how, uh, where the grain is lying. And in photocopy paper, in like this, it normally runs down lengthways, the grain. There are other ways of doing it. You can also hold the paper, which would be very difficult to do on screen like this, but you hold the paper uh, in, in, a, in, a way, in a way like that. And it's that bendability, bendability of the paper. Sometimes it'll only bend so much in the one direction and so much in the other direction, which tells you that the grain is in a particular direction. That's the second way. The third way of determining grain direction is to cut a little strip, probably about uh, 50 millimeters long and about uh, 15 millimeters wide, so it's a rectangle. And then take your finger, dip your finger in some water and rub the water across the paper, the same amount of water on two separate pieces of paper. And you'll see how that paper curls. We'll show you where, which way the grain is running. So you've got three different processes that you can see the fiber orientation or the grain direction. 
Now you might say to me, well, why do you want to know that? Well, you have to know that because if you are a printer, you need to know the grain direction of the paper you're putting in the machine because it plays a part in the performance of the machine as well as in the printing. Now, some of you in the room might well come from a printing industry. You know exactly what I'm referring to. If you don't, next time you are in, uh, uh, if you come into contact with someone who is in the printing industry, they will tell you how important grain direction is. Now, I've seen, I've explained grain direction to you in paper. There is grain direction in, in board as well. And it's even more critical when you are making a carton to know which way the grain is, especially if that carton is going to run on a high speed carton machine. So grain direction is important to those who use it. So you need to know because you never know if you ever end up in a, in a paper mill or you're working for a company that's making a corrugated board, you have to know grain direction. Right, and we always measure in grams per square meter. So how many, if you cut a, a square meter and you weighed it, that's the grams per square meter, but we never cut a meter. So we do it in proportion. We can cut a hundred millimeters and we perform, it's, it's just, we just do it on ratio analysis and we can work out the GSM. So we do not measure paper by thickness. We measure it by grams per square meter. When we come to board, then we measure in thickness. Okay, so it's around about 280 GSM. From about 280 GSM to 300 GSM, we switch over to board and we start measuring it by a caliper, a measuring gauge called a caliper. It's also called a micrometer or a um, uh, in, in, uh, uh, two measuring instruments in board is a micrometer and a vernier. Micrometer and a vernier, those are the two. Um, and if you don't know what a micrometer is, just Google micrometer and a micrometer will show you an image and do the same with vernier, V-E-R, N-I-E-R. Those are the two measuring instruments that you will need if you are in the paperboard industry. The other thing is moisture content. Very, very important. I cannot stress enough how much of, uh, um, how much moisture plays a part in paper and board and the performance of the paper and the board. Because if your relative humidity, your ambient your relative humidity is high, the water is going to be absorbed into the paper and the board. And your performance is going to be vastly reduced, vastly reduced. So moisture content, you have to have to understand it and you measure it prior to you working with it. And that is why we always say your uh, paperboard needs to acclimatize 24 hours before you are using it so that you are getting a board that is uh, in, in relation to the moisture content that you can work with to get a good performance out of. When we're making paper, and I told you that paper is from about 280 GSM and less, and the paper on your desk is about 80 GSM, when we have board, we uh, board can be right down to about uh, around about the 250 uh, micron um, thickness. Uh, would make would probably be the thinnest that you would make cartons from around about, and then right up to about 300, 400, and even more depending on the size of the carton. The way that we get that paper board thick. In other words, when we're going with paper, it's very thin. When we're going with board, it's quite thick. So the whole process is, is just a thicker process of, uh, of paper and board. Or 
we can, but it's not often, you could laminate a number of layers together to get your thickness. But why would you do that when you can just make it thicker on the fordrinia at the start and from the from the start? All right. So let's go through these processes. Just to uh, remind you, when the um, board comes out of the fordrinia or the paper, it looks like this. Well, bring us up to the camera and sort of see it's a very uneven finish, like an egg carton. Um, it's not smooth at all. Very difficult to uh, show you on the screen. But I'm, I'm sure all of you have seen an egg carton before. So when we're printing, we're printing it um, off what we call a roll stock. What do I, what do I mean by roll stock? That picture on the top left-hand side, that is called roll stock. So it's a roll of um, paper or paper board, depending on what the thickness is. So when that, when those, that, that it, it, it's unrolled, comes into your printing machine and they print, they print the actual board on to that, uh, they print the image onto that board, uh, cut it into, um, into sections, uh, before they cut it into the shape of a carton. So it comes off a roll and uh, it then gets cut and what we call cutting and creasing. Now, this is quite an interesting um, concept because for them to cut the shape of a carton out, if, they, if, they, if they're trying to make a carton like this, so if I open this carton up, so you've got a carton like that. You want to cut all around this particular carton. How do you do that? And that is done by a die. It's called a die, D-I-E. And it looks like that. Now, if I switch the camera off, see that? You can see here that this is, these are metal strips. And my finger is rubbing on this metal strip. So it can't cut me. That is a creasing mark on creasing line. But wherever the rubber is, which is these red pieces here, that's rubber. In between the rubber is a very sharp knife. That'll cut my finger if I press too hard. That's cutting through the board. The pink or the red, that is rubber. And it's helping the release of that uh, dye as it comes down on the board and when you lift the board up, the, the rubber is pushing the, the board away from this, this die. So that's why there's a rubbing. Unfortunately, if I was in the room, I could pass this around and you can actually see what it looks like. Alex has uh, seen this many times. This one fits in my briefcase and I carry it around for lecturing so that the, the, the students can see exactly how these things are cut. So this is only one single carton. Right. Um, so once the carton has been cut out, it has to, what we call stripping is, um, did you explain stripping to them, uh, Alex, when you were explaining? Yes, I, I did. Okay. And the following doing? Yeah, uh, enough time to strip. You know, like I already showed you, the box are bought like this on the market. It could be a folding box board, it could be a white line chip board, and then when they are then printed with the marks around them, you then have the die form that like, like cuts them, and then you strip them. After you strip them, you have something like uh, this other end, so what you look then you and then you then have a box. The same goes with this also. So then you then glue, and then you can now, sometimes you can erect by hand, sometimes you have a machine for erecting them. So basically, a box like this, even the one yesterday that we started with, it starts from 
a flat sheet like this, and then they put all the decorations, and then you like cut them and then you strip all the material, and then you then have them built. This is basically how they are plants. After you print, you like cut this soil, then have as plant, then they put them on a folder green machine who folds them. And then in some cases they might not need to be glued. In some cases, they already said so that you can fold them and then tuck them in. Today, we would like to invite you to take a behind-the-scenes look at IPAC, a state-of-the-art folding carton converter with headquarters in Kuwait and over 30 years of experience. Known for its creativity, high quality, and wide range of technical capabilities, IPAC also prides itself on outstanding personalized customer service. Once I packed your order, it is immediately entered into a sophisticated e-commerce system, one capable of handling cost estimating, scheduling, order tracking, document viewing, and change orders, all in a matter of seconds. This activity takes place in the customer service department, where our seasoned professionals guide customer orders from concept through delivery. In addition, customers also enjoy the freedom to access the IPAC system from their own locations. The end result, maximum flexibility for the customer and an ideal working relationship to everyone involved. The process relay begins in the structural design department where our experts and engineers apply their creativity to turning out original three-dimensional folding cartons IPAC showroom is jam-packed full of customer products that attest to the recognition of the company's creativity and customer satisfaction. High-profile customers in industries such as health and pharmaceutical, beauty, cosmetics, food, beverages, electronics, and computer peripherals have made IPAC their number one packaging supplier. Each design that I IPAC creates is fresh and unique, protecting the product it houses as well as setting it apart from the competition. If we are not creating added value for the customer through our packaging, then we are not doing our job. As more and more consumer products become commodities, an appealing and inventive package can make all the difference in winning marketplace success. Throughout the 10,000 square meter IPAC plant, Every manufacturing stage is seamlessly integrated via our online computerized system. The plant itself contains every leading edge technology needed to take a folding carton job from raw inventory to final product. All housed underneath one roof for convenience and speed. Our systems include roll sheeters, printing presses, die cutters, offline UV application, embossing and foil stampers, and high-speed gluing machines. IPAC inventory includes both pre-cut sheets and massive rolls of stocks. Rolls are custom cut for each order, thereby reducing trim waste. The IPAC operation is the company's structural design hardware and software applications. Instead of the typical trial and error, IPAC's dedicated design team, engineers, and specialists make it easy to design great packaging. What started as an electronic version of the design and engineering draft easily moves to the IPAC prototype stage, where the visualized idea turns into an actual sample with close to production CMYK process colors, white ink, coatings, spot UV, matte or glossy lamination, scoring, and die cutting capabilities. Prototypes allow our customers to touch, feel, and see the dimensions of the product, as well as visualize its display functionality. Not only do our customers save time, but also money through the reduction in the number of samples they need to get it just right the very first time. At IPAC, we don't just think in 3D, we design in 3D. Another rare of Ford manufacturing, 
Once the package has been printed and die cut, it is time to fold glue the carton. On this particular job, the machine folds and glues 25,000 cartons per hour. Here, we've slowed down the machine so that you can watch the mechanical folding take place. I pack creative strengths, dedication to customer service, commitment to quality, and investment in the newest and best technology have made all this possible. As workers carefully load the shipping cases, other customer jobs are at this very moment speeding through the IPAC plant on their way to a similar successful future. IPAC, your printing and packaging partner. Okay, let's have a look at some basic styles of cartons. And the, the most, the two most basic cartons, and and my father dominant cartons across the world are tube style and tray style. All that news that is vary in size, but they all are tubes, like a you know, toothpaste tube. That's a tube style carton. Um, it can also be what we call a um, uh, alternate tuck in end carton, which is that. Um, uh, second image, the second row uh, image, other way it says other tube style of cartons. That is alternate tucking in. So you can see that the two, um, the, the back and the front um, panels has the tuck in feature. And this is what they call alternate tuck in. And the reason for that is, is that when you lay it out on a board, a piece of board, on, on, on an area, the one is fitting in like a jigsaw with the next one, and therefore you're wasting much less uh, paperboard. Um, the one at the bottom, yeah, yeah it's still tube, but they're now putting a tuck end on it or a lock end, an H lock or a crash lock. Um, uh, they normally use like for, tuck, uh, for uh, tubs, of cream, hand cream, and stuff like that. They use that um, lock-in end, and uh, it's locked in so that it prevents the container falling through the bottom. If you don't have a proper lock on that system, uh, in, uh, and the weight is too great, it will fall uh, right through. And so one has to be really uh, mindful when you're designing that you uh, understand as many of the attributes as possible. Now, Alex has got one in his hand there. Um, that one that's in your hand, is that a, now oh, there we go, yeah. So let me go now, if you pass that round, then you can get an idea of what they what I um, was referring to regarding a locked, a locked end carton, as opposed to the, the second row of cartons there, the second row uh, carton, that's just a normal tucking end. It, it, it's easy to come apart. The matchbox um, type style, that is what we call a, 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 a shell and a slide carton. So it's slightly different to a normal tube type carton. So it isn't going to stand alone. Um, and then you get tray styles, and there are literally tens, or if not hundreds of different tray styles. They're just different um, sizes and, and different in their shape. But the principle of the design remains a tray style. And then you can put a window on it. And we discussed that yesterday in the, in the lectures. By putting a window on there, we can see what's inside. Either we can cut it out and leave it cut out, or we can put um, a layer of uh, a poly, some other poly material, um, a plastic or cellophane to cover the window and preventing people's fingers touching the product. But it's still a tube style carton. Don't be misled. All it has, it has a tuck out, a cutout. Now, you know, we're we going to have a lecture just on styles of cartons. There are heaps and heaps and heaps of different styles. So, but in, in principle, if one looks at them, other than the bottom left hand image here, which is an envelope style, all the others are of the same um, 
basic design as uh, tube and trays. They just put different shapes onto it, triangular shapes and odd shapes like uh, the top right hand side, um, but they still fall into those categories. So it's interesting to note how much these things are the same, Thanks although so they all look different. And once they're printed, they bring in those samples they look along. vastly, really different vastly different, different if they don't see a sample. Okay. So the, the, the carton design from a strength perspective is quite important in terms of if you want strength out of it, you need maybe a thicker board to make it stiffer. Um, you'll have, um, and, and the length of your fibers vary between a recycle board and a virgin type board. A uh, recycle board, it's the fibers have been broken down and broken down many, many times. So the strength of it is not there, it doesn't have stiffness. So if you're running through a uh, automatic cartoning machine or a carton, a carton erector, you need a very crisp, um, a very um, uh, uh, crisp board that uh, bends nice and easily and the tucking goes very quickly and easily into when you're closing the, the, the board off. And that is why you won't often find uh, the recycle boards um, uh, in, a, in a pharmaceutical um, industry. They use the more expensive boards because it's a more expensive type product and is an image related, but also they're running some of, uh, many of those products are running on, on high speed cartoning machines and you need a very, uh, you, number one, you need a virgin board and a very, um, uh, a, a material that has long fibers. Long fibers come from slow growing trees as opposed to short fibers come from fast growing trees, like a pine tree would be um, an example of a, of a fast growing short fiber tree. So all these fibers um, uh, directly relate to the stiffness um, and the crispness and the quality of the finished product. Unfortunately, it comes with a price tag. Right, I just included this just to show you some new ideas that are, that are happening from time to time around the world. This is a wine bottle made from paperboard and um, it is, um, it, it, it was more, it was made from a, for a promotion um, uh, situation. And uh, there shows you what it looks like inside. Inside is actually a plastic liner for the wine. So it's not completely paperboard, but it does give you an idea that you can mold paper into practically any shape that you want to. So it's just really for, uh, for promotion, really for branding that they created that particular pack. And then just, just so that we don't miss, uh, miss this one, I thought I'd just include it in here because it's also paper and board. Um, and this is where they use it on the edges of pallets, for example, as a protector. They also use them in cores um, for thick rolls. Even your toilet roll has a core in the middle and it's made from paper. Um, they also use it for cushioning materials. Uh, so I just added this one slide in here so that all of you know, uh, forget that this is also uh, a form of uh, packaging or it, it's an ancillary um, uh, packaging, not actual packaging itself, but it does help the packaging um, in, in the process, either in the process of getting from one point to another as a protector or um, in conveying large rolls of materials. And you get such a variety of cores, the, the bottom image, such a variety of cores. So.